source of their physical desires and something that they want, the food, the bread, and are trying to manipulate him into doing their will. Whereas we see towards the end of this passage, Simon Peter declares when asked, is he and the other disciples going to leave Jesus also? He responds, where else are we going to go? And tells Jesus, you are the one who have the words of everlasting life. And that's a theme throughout this, this section, 6, uh, 22 to 71, is a picture of Jesus as being the bread of life who gives everlasting life, not who is giving a physical meal every day. And so to one group, we're going to see it's a hindrance. To another group, it is a focusing point that focuses them on the truth. So we saw, <coughs> excuse me, fourth and fifth sign last week that really lead into this passage. And then of the seven discourses, this would be the fourth discourse. And it's also the first of seven I am statements where Jesus declares himself, I am the bread of life here. So I'll come back to that slide in a minute. So verses 22 to 24 are setting the stage as far as the time period to link it in with the previous. Um, we saw last week, chapter 6 started with a after these things, basically an indeterminate amount of time. Here, there's a very specific amount of time. So starting in verse 22, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So the setting of this starts with on the following day. So this is directly linked chronologically to Jesus feeding the 5,000. The previous day, they've tracked him down. He's provided a great meal for them. And then overnight... After the meal, they go their separate ways. He withdraws because he recognizes that their intent is to try to make him king, to be a leader to throw off the Romans as a political nationalistic ruler. And that's not the father's will, and so it's not his will. So he completely withdraws himself, and they're not sure where he's gone. The disciples at the same time have gotten in a boat, headed from where the feeding of the 5,000 would have been, let me go back, which was likely kind of in a mountainous wilderness area near Bethsaida. They've gone to the port where they left their boat tied up that they had used to get from Tiberias to there earlier, and they've headed off. And in the night, the wind has kicked up off of the Golan Heights and has kicked up a, a storm of wind and waves, and Jesus comes walking on the water, and saves them, and they end up at Capernaum. And the disciples took the trip completely by boat. Jesus took the trip across the water partially on foot and partially in the boat. And so here the next morning, the individuals who have partaken of the meal the day before are hungry again, and looking to see, okay, where did Jesus go? Where did his disciples grow? So they go to the port, and they find that the only boat that was there would have been the one that the disciples entered and left in, and nobody saw Jesus get in that. But yet they search around. Jesus is not there. He's gone. At this point, some other boats from Tiberias arrive, and they don't know anything about where Jesus is, but now there's boats there. So they get in those boats and take them to Capernaum. And in Capernaum, they find Jesus. Now they know the disciples got there by boat, but they're not sure how Jesus got there. 
And so this is set chronologically right after the feeding of the 5,000, right after the walking in the water the next day, and the people are trying to track him down. So they followed him for Capernaum, and we're going to see the reason for following him is they want more bread. And so the question in verse 25 kind of opens what becomes a series of questions and challenges that they pose to Jesus. And these questions and challenges they pose to Jesus are not really innocent. They are an attempt to manipulate and force Jesus' hand so that he will do what they want him to do. So this is, this, the fourth of the seven discourses, is a bit of a challenge debate where there's a series of questions that the people challenge Jesus with trying to get him to do their will. And it starts with what any challenge debate of that time period would start with, with a opening question that is, doesn't appear to be controversial and pays a compliment to the person that you're challenging. And so in verse 25, their first question of a series of questions here is that when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So the first question is not particularly offensive, not particularly off-putting. It's like, well, when did you get here in Capernaum? And they start with Rabbi, which should have been a very high honor to call somebody rabbi is the highest status of teacher. But here it's more likely in the context, this is a little bit more of a um, trying to flatter somebody before you ask them to give you something. It's not a true compliment, where a true compliment is saying something good about somebody that's true but not having an ulterior motive of wanting something in return for that compliment. Where flattery may be true compliment, but the underlying motivation of it is always for self-gain. Saying something nice so that person will then do something nice for you. And so there's a lack of sincerity here. Now, the when did you come here, that question is because they've been searching for him. They know the disciples got in the only boat that was at the port, the boat launch that was closest to the feeding of the 5,000, and they know Jesus wasn't in that boat when it set sail away from shore. They've questioned around, and they have no idea where Jesus has gone, but they've kind of figured out, well, since the disciples took a boat towards Capernaum, let's go there, and they find, lo and behold, there's Jesus. And they're thinking, well, how did he get here? And this is where they may be kind of connecting the dots a little bit, and they may have heard a little bit of rumor from one overhearing the disciples or something, that since he wasn't in the boat when it left, but somehow he did make it to Capernaum, he walked. And maybe he miraculously walked in the water. They don't know for sure, but there's some indication that this question is, how did you get here? Because we're thinking something pretty spectacular happened. Now, Jesus doesn't answer their question directly as far as how he physically got there. And we'll see why as his response extends in 26 and 27. So Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. His response to them is immediately a rebuke in that he's like, you're not following me for the right reasons. You just got a really good free meal yesterday, and you want another free meal today, and you're going to want another free meal tomorrow, and you're not recognizing that that was a sign to authenticate so that, oops, a little too far back, the theme of the Gospel of John. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That theme verse 
for the Gospel of John. We've seen before, and I'm pulling it back in here because that's going to become the focus of this discourse, is believing that Christ is the Son of God and that life comes through him. Here, they're wanting the bread, the physical bread. So Jesus goes on in verse 27, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has his, set his seal on him. So here, Jesus isn't saying that one should labor for everlasting life by saying, do not labor for food which per, per, perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. He's not saying they can earn it by laboring. He's making a comparison that their goal and their work and their effort and their focus should be not on the physical bread that they want right now, but rather on bread that doesn't perish, belief in him and everlasting life. He also emphasizes that it is a gift from God, where he says, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has his seal on him. So he's saying that this is a gift. So their second question, their follow-up question to his statement here, in verses 28 and 29, we have their second question and Jesus' response. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? They're not quite getting it. And he's just told them, their focus shouldn't be on the physical bread. It should be on the spiritual bread, which is a gift. And the response is, well, what work do we have to do? And he answers them and says, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he sent. The bread of life, the everlasting life, what he is trying to focus them on is not a work that we do, it's a work that God has done through Jesus and that the work, if there is a work for us to do, is to believe. And by believing, we will receive that gift that is given from God through the Son. And so his response to them in asking, when did you come here? He's refocusing on what's important, kind of like his conversation with the Samaritan woman. She tried to kind of distract, and he kept drawing her back to the living water and to the gospel, essentially. He's doing the same thing here, but the metaphor instead of living water is going to be the bread of life. And their response in verse 30 is very telling. So therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? So here, they've just kind of started somewhat non-confrontationally in asking him, well, when did you get here? And then asking him, what can we do to do the works of God? showing that they, you know, they have a good heart. They want to do the works of God. And when he tells them that they need to believe in him who he sent, which, of course, would be himself, now it turns to the heart of what their, their, their motivation and their challenge is. What work will you do? Now, what's ironic about this is he's already tell, told them exactly what work he and his father are doing. The work that he and his father are doing is giving them everlasting life if they believe in him. What more can you ask for? He's already said what the work is. The work is to give everlasting life if they believe. All they have to do is believe. 
But yet, that's not what they're looking for here. That's not where their heart is. They're misinterpreting this. And so instead, they're coming back to, we want you to do something, Jesus, right now. And just in case he doesn't get the hint, they go on in verse 31 to explain and give him a hint of what sort of work that he should do. And that is, they go on to say, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. He's just told them, don't labor for the food which perishes, but the food which endures, which is a gift from God if they believe in him. And the response is, well, what work are you going to do to, to prove that? And, by the way, the work that we're kind of looking for, the correct answer we're looking for you, is for you to give us another meal today. And not only that, what's really interesting about this is this is the only time in the gospel where somebody other than Jesus or the narrator in the gospel uses scripture to defend their point. So their basis seems good. They're using scripture here. They're saying our fathers ate man in the desert as it is written in the scriptures. He gave them bread from heaven to eat and they would be referring to the book of Exodus, where Moses, from their viewpoint, gave them manna every day. He didn't give them manna one day, he gave it every day. So they're saying to Jesus, you fed us yesterday, what work are you going to do today to prove your worth to us? And by the way, Moses did this every day in the desert. If you're so great, you'll do that for us too. They're kind of passive-aggressively trying to push him into a point of pride where he's going to be like, okay, fine, here's the bread every day. Um, but Jesus isn't working from a, a standpoint of human pride. He's working from a standpoint of confidence of being the creator God who isn't going to be manipulated. And so they're challenging Jesus to do what they desire so that he will prove himself. But the end goal here is not so that they will believe. The end goal is so they will get what they want. They want this food from him because lunch the day before must have been really good. So in verse 32, and uh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself there. So in verse 32 and 33, Jesus responds to this. And he says to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. So first, he corrects their use of scripture. They're using the scripture wrong. It wasn't that Moses gave them the bread. It was that God the Father gave him the bread. And he would know that because from the beginning, he was with God and was God. They don't need to tell him what happened in the desert with Moses. Um, he was one with God in making this happen. And verse 32 goes on, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And this word gives links back to where he started in verse 27 with his first response to their first question in that, the Son of Man will give you because the Father has set his seal on him. He's come, he corrects them and comes back to where he started. Gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They asked him what work he would do, and he's telling them again the work that he is doing. He is the bread of life who has come down from heaven, being sent from the Father, to not give them physical life and physical meals, but to give them everlasting life. What's interesting in verse 32 is when he corrects them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. He's saying past tense, that was something that God did. And goes on to say, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The tent shifts. He's not saying there 
but my father gave you manna, he's saying that present tense, at this moment, my father is giving you the true bread from heaven, who, by the way, is standing in front of them telling him, them this. He's now using this to equate himself as being greater than the manna that was given on a daily basis. And the reason it had to be given on a daily basis was the same reason why the sacrificial lambs had to be continuously killed because they were just a picture. They were just a temporary. The, the manna was not something that was going to sustain them for everlasting life. That was a picture of the bread of life that would come. Just as this is, we said that chapter 6 started around the time of the Passover. So the Passover, the lamb was killed and eaten. Its blood was shed and its flesh was eaten so that as a reminder of how God rescued the Israelites from Egypt and how their households were protected from the angel of death, and here is a picture we're seeing. Jesus is that bread of life. Jesus is that lamb of God who takes away the sin, but not on a daily basis in terms of needing to do it over and over again, once and for all. And so verse 34 their next question shifts more to a demand or a request rather than a question. And at this point, very clearly, they're still not understanding. And at this point, based on how the request shifts, they kind of think Jesus isn't understanding. He's not getting the point. They've been asking him to give them bread and he's talking about this, this everlasting life stuff. Um, and so now the response in verse 34 is they're like, okay, we've got to make it really clear to this guy rather than the question. We're just going to outright say what we want. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. We want you, here's a challenge, you give us this every day type of thing. And here, though, even though this may seem like a good thing because he just told them, this is the bread of life that's come down from heaven, but that's not what they're asking for. And it becomes fairly clear this is not what they're asking for as we kind of read onward. But here, they're still asking for that physical manna, basically. They're wanting that physical bread. They're like, oh, if you're so great to give us this bread of life, you should be able to give this every day and we'll eat and we don't have to work and, and you can be our leader and then we'll conquest over Rome um, because we'll have more free time on our hands because we won't have to work for food so we can build up an army and, and whatever else. Um, they're still thinking of the image of that manna because keep in mind, there was a similarity with what Jesus is talking about and the manna in that the manna came down from heaven and Jesus is saying that this bread of life is coming down from heaven. The difference, though, is the manna came each day, and the manna was just a physical sustenance for that day. Whereas the bread of life that Jesus is offering is like the living water that he offered the Samaritans that is life everlasting from a spiritual standpoint. And then the second thing is the manna was just given to the Israelites, where this bread of life is coming down and being given to all. And so Jesus goes on to explain this in verse 35, and Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, he's not saying that a believer will never physically hunger or never physically thirst. But he's saying that because the bread of life, the living water that he gives is the way to everlasting life beyond physical life. That's the never hungering and never thirsting that he's talking about. 
He goes on, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Unlike the disciples, unlike what we saw in chapter 1 with John and Andrew, listening to John the Baptist declaring that that guy over there, Jesus, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins, and they immediately believed and followed him. And then shared, and Andrew shares that with his brother, Simon Peter. And Simon Peter believes. And then Jesus approached Philip, and Philip believes and shares with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel initially doubts what good can come out of Nazareth. And then when Jesus shows him that he knew Nathaniel's thought, Nathaniel proclaims, this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. And like the Samaritans, who, when they were offered living water, or the testimony of living water through the Samaritan woman, they believed on the words. Here, these individuals, Jesus is saying to them, look, you've seen these signs, and yet you don't believe. Uh, this is in contrast to the true faith that the others showed, and the true faith was an emphasis on believing Jesus' words that were authenticated by his signs. These individuals want him to do the signs to provide them with something they desire, but don't believe. And so he goes on to say, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's again echoing what he talked about in the previous discourse, that the Father and Son are one, and what the Father does, the Son does, and what the Son does, the Father does. He's again equating himself as God to these individuals, and basically telling them that if they reject him, they're also rejecting God. But they're also pointing out here that all that the Father gives me will come to me. He's also starting to point out a theme that comes up here that it's not entirely that they're rejecting him. It's that they've already been rejected by God. Is that God, they would be responding if they were one who God had given to him. So he is not, he's turning the tables on him and not just saying to them, you're rejecting me. He's saying to these individuals who are Israelites and some of them the devout Jewish leadership, he's telling them, unless you believe, God has rejected you. And so he goes on to say, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And he's saying, not only has he been given the power to give everlasting life, he's been given the power of resurrection, a theme that showed up in, in, in the previous discourse. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So again, he's coming back to... The will of the Father is that everyone will believe on the Son and have everlasting life. And so along with saying that, well, the Father chooses, he's also saying there's an individual responsibility on the believer's part or on the unbeliever's part to either choose or reject. Now, that's somewhat paradoxical and goes to the question of free will versus um, the election. And I think in this passage, the clear reading is, is election, is it free will? And I, I think the most direct reading is yes. Um, somehow, paradoxically, it's both. Um, from God's per perspective, it's he's choosing electing. From our perspective, it's we need to believe. And that's a whole bigger discussion than, than what we'd want to get into here with less than 10 minutes to cover quite a few verses here. Um, but I think the clear reading of this is this passage teaches is election and free will, yes. Um, somehow both, and I think that the, the simplest explanation to that is God is infinite and can understand how that is not a contradiction and that it's a paradox. A paradox being something that appears contradictory but really isn't when you see the big picture. 
Whereas us, from a finite human standpoint, we clearly do not see the big picture. Clearly, the people here saw even less of the picture than hopefully we see. But we still don't see the really big picture that maybe we'll understand when we're in heaven and having an, enjoying everlasting life. And no longer worrying about that daily physical bread because our life is in the bread of life, the everlasting life. So now in verse 41, to make it very clear that they don't get what he's talking about, they have another question. But at this point, this question's a little bit different. They're not directing it directly to him at this point. They are grumbling and mumbling and complaining to themselves. So the Jews then complained, and in some English translations, it would be grumbled or murmured about him because he said, I am the bread which comes down from heaven. And they said, is not the Jesus, this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? So here, they very clearly do not believe. Because here, they're like, how can he say he's the bread that came down from heaven? He was born of a carpenter and a carpenter's wife who there's suspicions that she may have had a baby before wedlock. And how can that be from heaven? Um... What's also interesting here is they've been asking for manna. And what they are doing now, we're not going to take time to go there, but in Exodus 16, they're doing exactly what led to two things. One, Moses giving them manna from God, but then also them having many of them wandering in the wilderness and dying in the wilderness and not being allowed to go into the promised land. And that is, they murmured, they grumbled against Aaron and Moses and said, ah, you've taken us out into the wilderness. We should have stayed in Egypt where the cantaloupes were nice and the food was nice. There's kind of a theme here. Um, and granted, most of us kind of like nice food. Um, they, ha they were quoting that scripture, but they missed an important part of that scripture. Part of that scripture was Israelites learning that when you grumble and mumble against the leadership, Aaron and Moses, they were rejecting God. They weren't just rejecting Aaron and Moses. And here they're doing the same thing. They're grumbling and mumbling against the true leadership, except this time they're not doing it to God's agent, Moses. They're doing it to God himself. Um, and so Jesus then responds, similar to Moses did, but this is even more direct because Moses responded to what God instructed him to, where here God is directly correcting them and they don't see it. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. So he restates, his Father draws them. And here the connotation that draw is the object that's being drawn in is completely incapable of resistance. Salvation is a work of God through Jesus. It's not of us. The only part that we play is believing and yielding. It's a work of God. And even that believing part, God is drawing us so that we are incapable of not responding. And it is written in the prophets and they shall be taught by God. So now he quotes the scripture. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God who has seen the Father, which would be him. And he's reinforcing, believe his words, believe God, have everlasting life. Reject those words, reject God. He's telling them you cannot say that you're accepting God of Moses and rejecting the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself. Reject one, you reject both, because they're one. 
So most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. And he's referring right back to his first answer to the first question. Basically, throughout this, Jesus is basically repeating the same thing over and over again to each of their questions. They're shifting their question, and he knows they're trying to manipulate him to shift his stance. And he is not going to shift his stance. He is the rock that we shift to. They pointedly said, give us this bread. And in verse 48, he pointedly tells them, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. He's saying as great as the manna was, it was a physical nourishment. And everybody who ate that died. He is saying those who eat his flesh will have everlasting life. They're asking for the wrong thing. They're focused on the wrong thing. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Now, he's not talking about that not going to need physical nourishment and not going to die physically. But even if any of us had a, a great supply of food every single day of our life, eventually we would physically die. That food is going to nourish us temporarily. And at death, we then face judgment and the second death. And with that, it is either we've believed in the bread of life and have everlasting life, or we haven't and have everlasting separation and torment. And so he goes on, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give in the life of the world. And so now he's equating his flesh to that. Kind of the tie to that sacrificial lamb that they would have eaten at Passover time. He's saying he's the sacrificial lamb that is going to die so that we can live. Also, in, in our culture, this reference to, to eating of flesh and, and, and drinking of blood would, would seem kind of weird. And to some extent, it would have seemed offensive to them also because in Genesis, they were told, don't eat the blood because that's where the life is. And here he's telling them, eat of his flesh and his blood. But also, in terms of Jewish tradition, there's a tighter tie here that they should have understood the metaphor a little bit better. In Ezekiel 2 and 3, Jesus gives a prophet, not Jesus, excuse me, God, well, God gives the prophet Ezekiel a book of the words of God and tells him to eat it and then proclaim it. Jesus is the word. So here this metaphor is similar. He's been compared the word and we are to eat and proclaim it. Also, in Jewish tradition, the Torah Excuse me, the manna became a symbol of eating the Torah and God's wisdom. So there was a picture of taking the bread that God had given and turning it into a picture of God's word. Well, here, Jesus is taking a picture of him as God's word being that flesh and blood that needs to be consumed so that the believer can be abiding and remaining and becoming one with him, just like he's one with the Father and one with the Spirit. And so that's where that imagery comes from. And in this case, the imagery really is not an imagery looking forward to communion, which is more of a symbol looking back to this. This imagery here has more to do with consuming the Word of God as being a a metaphor for believing the Word of God. And salvation doesn't come through communion. This isn't isn't about a sacrament of of communion. This is about believing. And so then the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So their next question, now this question they're they're fighting amongst each other about. They've given up asking him questions. Um, And then Jesus says to him, because even though they've given up on asking him questions, he has not given up on giving them answers. Then Jesus says to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. 
He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me as I in him. And here the picture of eating and drinking is becoming one with Christ through belief. And this, this, this theme of abiding in him, we've kind of seen in that when John the Baptist proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, the sign, the reason he knew Jesus was because he saw the Holy Spirit come down and remain or abide in Jesus, showing that the Spirit and Jesus are one. In chapter 1, it started with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, from the beginning, Jesus was abiding and was one with God. Now Jesus is saying, if the believer believes this, it is as they're eating and drinking his flesh and becoming one and abiding with him and the Father and the Spirit. Also in here is the emphasis on this being something from the Father. There can be no children without the Father. The children come from the Father. This is why the Father chooses the children in this case. Children don't choose their parents. Um, the image here of the Father and the children of God is that there is no children without the Father. They've got it backwards. Uh, so let's see, where are we right now? Um, so continue on, verse 56, he eats my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats the bread will live forever. So he's emphasizing to them again, you're still asking for the wrong bread, you're asking for the physical bread that's temporary, everyone who eats that is going to die. And when you die, you need to know, is your life right with the living God? And these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, the synagogue was normally where the people would come to speak to God. Here in this synagogue, on that day in Capernaum, God has come to the people and is speaking to them directly. And so verse 60 and following, we have the last section I'll try to summarize very quickly, so I don't really want to carry this over to next week. Um, let's see. Let me read the section quickly and then comment. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless he has been granted to him by my father. There can be no children without the father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So in verses 60 through 65, his response is to the crowd as a whole, who is murmuring and saying, this is an offensive, hard saying. Who can understand it and who can accept it? And Jesus says, does this offend you? And then he challenges him in verse 62. What are you going to say should you see the Son of Man ascend when he was where he was before? They've been questioning, wait a minute, you're, you're from Joseph and Mary. How can you be from heaven? He's telling them, what are you going to say when he ascends back to where his home is from the beginning? They're going to be without excuse. Because, and then he goes on to say, 
Make it very clear to them. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. He's saying, you're going after the wrong thing. You're going after the, the bread that nourishes the flesh. You need to go after the bread that nourishes the spirit that he's offering. And at this point, in verse 66, we see from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And there's a couple kind of double meanings in there. From that time can also be translated for this reason. And both apply here. We've seen those double meanings in the Gospel of John before. It's saying at that time, because they would not accept him as the bread of life, they walked with him no more. Walking with no more, for a disciple to walk no more with their teacher was very significant. It meant that that disciple had completely rejected and resigned from the beliefs and teaching of that rabbi to walk no more with them. So from that time, many of them walked away because they could not. They wanted the bread of physical life, not the bread of spiritual life. And so then he turns to the 12. Do you want to go away also? And Simon Peter's response was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And what's remarkable there is throughout this, we've seen this emphasis they wanted to see signs or they wouldn't believe. Here, Peter is showing true faith again. He's believing because of the words, and the signs have just given more confidence to his belief. Because remember, even though it wasn't in the account of the Gospel of John, when Jesus came walking across the water, Peter stepped out of the boat and walked to him, and then started sinking and was saved. So Peter has seen some additional lessons that have helped him understand the words better than maybe some others, um, and, and kind of proclaims that here. Uh, we should wrap up some way over time. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Help us to apply these words for life, and help us to look for you for life rather than our own understanding. Also help us to look for you for life, for what you offer, rather than what we would have you offer in our selfish desires. In Jesus' name, amen.